MBA course in uh, animal disaster response and emergency medicine. So we have 24 um, B17 and B16 students that are taking that class. We have a member of our technical staff from the large animal hospital, and we have two shelter medicine residents that have been taking that class. We've been learning lots about preparedness and setting up for disasters and doing some hands hands-on activities. Um, today we had some stuff with Dr. Gordon talking about um, how to decontaminate animals that get exposed to different hazards in the field. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gordon to our campus. Um, she served as a veterinary medical officer with DMAT-1, which is the federal um, animal disaster response team for over 10 years. And then she's currently serving with the um, national veterinary response team. Um, she's also with our Massachusetts Task Force 1, which is a, a Massachusetts-based search and rescue team. Um, she's done that since 2002, and her role is to care for search canines during training, um, certifications, and deployment. She's a subject matter expert for FEMA with regards to taking care of search, search dogs in the field, and she lectures to, sounds doing weird things, sorry about that, um, EMTs, paramedics, doctors, and handlers, as well as um, what we learned this morning, chemical and other types of hazardous exposure. Um, she developed a canine decontamination system for use in the field because it turns out that what they use for people doesn't really work for the four-legged ones. So we're going to be practicing with um, our state team um, uh, this afternoon with some of her um, designs. I have a couple people to thank, um, Dr. Davis Schwartz and Dr. Laura Lozan from our state animal response team are here and they're going to be helping the students with our decon lab and they're the ones that um, helped us secure Dr. Gordon as a speaker, so thank you very much, guys. Um, and also to the ASPCA for sponsoring our course and allowing us to have speakers and supplies to play around with. Thanks very much. Enjoy the talk. Hello, thanks for coming. Uh, this is Gavner Abigail. She's a six and a half year old Boston mix from Georgia. She is certified by the International Food Working Dog Association and Human Remains Protection. So, uh, she's my demo dog for first aid, and I teach her some human, human medics because there aren't a lot of veterinarians in the first responder system. So, I'm going to talk about veterinarians in search and rescue, and then we'll go a little bit about the rise of the working dog, how much they've improved, and uh, something I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but the human and the bond, and what I see when I deploy. <coughs> I don't know anyone else who would allow dogs on the table to just start pizza on. So there have been a few things that have changed over the years. Uh, it's been in this since uh, the late 1990s. And one is the rise of a trained first responder veterinarian in disaster situations. There are many more in the systems now than there ever were before. There's also been improvements in the dogs that we use for search. There's better breeding, better training, and they have better search capabilities. And then the strength of the human-animal bond, something that's been around for over 10,000 years, has recently been recognized legally with the Pet Act. So historically, canine search teams do not include veterinarians. There are no specific positions for them on the team. There are always human medics or there's nobody. There are a few of them associated with 
urban search and rescue team, like New Jersey. And then a few FEMA teams, we had one uh, with Dr. Otto with Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Honecker with Virginia, and Dr. Grant in California. Other options when people deploy, they use local veterinarians, animal-based responders like the Veterinary Medical Assistance Team, which is the AVMA sponsors, the National Veterinary Response Team, which is a governmental organization, uh, these organizations, however, are very financially dependent and their training is very varied. They're training on how to respond <coughs> safely to a disaster. So I joined the VMAT team back in 1998-1999 because the idea of helping animals in disaster was very intriguing to me. We have uh, veterinarians, vet techs, and support personnel like logistics. <clears throat> we trained in small animal, large animal, and exotic. This was a training down at Peach River Ranch down in Florida. I got to neuter a Bengal tiger and a wolf. A wolf. But the idea was not to do the surgery, it was to deploy as a team, set up our building, our feeding, set up the <laughs> hospital, and work as a team. So this training, very, very important to train. We did have limited supplies, but it was a very dedicated group. So we got to do a lot of things. Well, lo and behold, my first real deployment was a pretty big one, and that was the World Trade Center. We deployed and took care of the search dog. Uh, I was at the Javits Center for three days, and we took care of the animals when they came in after their 12-hour shift. We set up a hospital and a tent, and uh, that's why I first learned about FEMA teams. After the first 72 hours at the Javits Center, I went down to uh, the hut zone, the pile, and I met Dr. Cindy Otto, who was with Pennsylvania Task Force One. I met, didn't know about her, the search and rescue team. But I learned a lot that day. And one of the main components of the team is to be self-sufficient for the first 72 hours of the disaster, completely self-sufficient. One of the reasons is oftentimes the local supplies are gone or used up by the local um, people or they're, because of the disaster, there aren't any. There's no water, there's no gas, there's no food. The other thing is, even if there is some of that, we don't want to take away from the local population that needs those particular supplies in a disaster situation. They need them for their shelters and for their hospitals. <clears throat> so we have our own supplies and we have our own search dogs. And typically, the human medics and MDs are responsible for taking care of the dogs. They get four hours of training. It's up to six right now. I've been able to spread it out to eight. And that's all they get. They only have to do it once. So, I mean, I'd love to do surgery on a human. I think that'd be really cool. But it's not my day job. And so taking care of dogs is not their day job. I happen to have um, an incredibly supportive task force leader, Mark Foster, and he supported my position on the team. So I began with the Mass Task Force. I put in an application right after the World Trade Center, and I trained with, been with them ever since. There's still no veterinary position on these teams. There are uh, 28 teams in the country. There is 70 rostered positions and 10 alternate positions. I go as an alternate position. So my idea was, to work within the system to better the care, better the supplies, and the training for the dog. What happened with the canine decontamination protocols that we developed was because there weren't any. And uh, the, hazmat team, the hazmat group on my team and myself developed that. There's also no database for the illnesses and injuries that these search dogs incur on their deployment, except for there was the uh, uh, the um, article from Duhame for the World Trade Center, for the, um, for the uh, Oklahoma bombing, excuse me, 
and then Cindy Otto and others and Dr. Phil Fox did some stuff on the World Trade Center. So we have that as a base. So my long-term goal was to add to that data. The reason is when we know what they incur or why they incur it, we can be better prepared. So if they have a lot of cuts, I know I need a lot of bandaging material. And also, because there are so few veterinarians in the system, I can train the medics and human doctors what to expect and concentrate on teaching them how to put on a proper bandage, which you know can be a challenge sometimes without your stirrup, uh, and so they can help the animals when there aren't any veterinarians there. And the last thing I, I, I got to do was the task force sponsored a website, usarveterinarygroup.org, so that other veterinarians in the system could share information and then provide that information to uh, anyone who wanted it. So I went to, um, I, I got into this fascinating world of, of Washington's theme of politics. It, it is, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, so I attended uh, meetings of the working group. We had a three-tier system. We have the task forces, working group meetings to bring out new ideas. Those meetings, those ideas would go to the operations group, and then final approval in Washington. I also attended hazmat working groups to find out, well, what are the dogs getting? They don't get any protection. How are they being treated? How are they being decontaminated? And I introduced the system to them, decontamination. Logistics, we needed to revise the canine medical cache. They still had uh, Robitussin on there, and that's fine, but um, they needed a lot more supplies to treat the canine. My other goal was to create a veterinary officer position. There aren't any in the, there weren't any in the system. Now they're not going to add a position to these teams. That's kind of written in stone. But there was no position description, no PB for a veterinarian. So even though I deployed and others deployed, we had no workman's compensation coverage, no liability coverage, no actual license to practice outside of, outside of the state that we were already licensed in. The medics had that, the human MDs had that, but veterinarians didn't. So I needed to create a position and get that approved. It actually only took seven years I was so happy. Um, it, it did. It took seven years, but you need to remember I was um, a civilian, and there's a lot of firefighters and police in the system. I am a woman and small, and um, they didn't know me from anybody. I just showed up at a meeting one day. So you need to prove yourself. You, and I think whatever you do in life, when you believe in what you're trying to do, you think it's really going to be a good thing, uh, you can show that to others with dedication and work and time. And there was a lot of time at the bar. That's where deals were made, just like on TV. Yes, I went to the meetings. Yes, I put in the proposals. Yes, we had the votes. But I got the votes because I got the glass of wine at the bar. Um, so uh, because I went to these meetings and got myself known, not a bull in a china shop, just kind of quietly telling my story, uh, we got cash improvements, more veterinary appropriate medications and supplies, and training, and the decontamination system that we developed that we just had to talk on uh, was approved by FEMA so they would fund it. So all the teams could have one. Funding is very big. It's uh, a very important part of being able to do the things we do. So the canine injury and illness data that we got from um, Duhame's Oklahoma City bombing, bombing and the World Trade Center, uh, very important as a starting point. But we've had a lot more deployments since then. So I just wrote these for FEMA within the system, either on SurveyMonkey or sending, sending out uh, emails to get the data. 
and these are uh, the uh, seven that have been sent to Washington, just to get an idea of what's going on with these dogs, what's happening to them. Is it still dehydration that's the problem? Do they get anything else? Is it different for different things? Is it different for a tornado versus an earthquake versus a mudslide? Uh, I did have two of them published because they were a little bit unique. Uh, there had never been a, a, an international foreign deployment published, so that was the Haiti paper. And the Oso Washington landslide paper was very interesting because it was the first time that that IST veterinarian officer position was deployed. That was me. And so for the first time, I had medical records. I'm a little, I love records. I love having the data there instead of just asking the handler, what happened to your dog? How did they treat it? What did they do? What was, what was the medication? They didn't know most, some of the time. So between the medical records, the first time a veterinarian deployed, and the first landslide deployment that FEMA has had, it was also the first human remains detection dog deployment. So a lot of firsts. So I uh, jab them like that, so they, they publish that after a lot of editing. So what these things have done is allowed us to get some more um, IST veterinary officers onto more teams so that when, we're, when we deploy three or four or five teams and we have 20 to 40 dogs, we have a veterinarian there to help. The order of care, the order of priority by the book is uh, for our medics is team members first, human team members first, canine team members next, third are the victims. When we go out and rescue victims of disaster, we triage them, we care for them, and then they go on to a DMAT unit, which is a um, uh, human medical unit, or they go to a hospital, the military. We don't set up hospitals. We just uh, search, rescue, care for, and then on they go. So that's what's been happening for the past uh, 12, 14 years in veterinarians is their rise in the system. Now we're asked to deploy. I think that's really great. I hope more veterinarians can get involved and help the dogs. Not that the human medics can't, can't do it, uh, but then I want to do human. So um, if you want to work with your team, if you want to deploy, there is, um, uh, you can join a local FEMA team. There are 28 of them across the country. You can join a local wilderness team or a county team or a state team and uh, show your skills, show how you can help. It doesn't pay anything unless you deploy. So when we deploy, we do get paid 24-7. Thank you very much, tax dollars at work. Uh, but overall, it's a labor of love and it's a real joy to work with these, with these dogs. That is Dr. Honecker right there, putting on a very big bandage I see. Uh, that was down in Haiti, and this is Dr. Laura Madsen out of Utah, and she deployed to um, some uh, hurricanes out west. <clears throat> so another thing that's been a tremendous help to me as a veterinarian is the, the search dogs are better. There's better breeding. Um, there's breeding centers. We've learned more. There's better training. We are thankfully letting go of the negative reinforcement training and going with the positive reinforcement training. As far as the breeding goes, there are traits of certain breeds that seem more amenable to search than others. In the FEMA system, about 85% of the dogs are black lab. There's a few chocolates, spoopies, and yellow labs, but most of them are black labs. And then our German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois, and some of the herding breeds. And they do this because of their personality and their drive. But the traits, we're better at recognizing traits. You don't fit the dog to the job, you fit the job to the dog. 
So a little dabby do there. We started her off with lie fine. She wasn't high drive enough, so we switched to human remains, and what she's done very well. You'll have a litter of 10 pups, and they're tested very early. You put their little bowl of food maybe at four to six weeks on the other side of a mini rebel pile, and you'll see which ones go over it like crazy, which ones kind of go around, which ones stay back. And you can divide those 10 pups. Maybe two will be great lie find because you need, you need to find those people fast. They're dying under there. Maybe they've got great hunt drive, but they'll be better at human remains because they don't have quite the drive. Maybe they push everybody out of the way. Maybe they'll be better patrol dogs. Maybe they go off to try to catch the little bunny rabbits and be better bird dogs. Some of them will be so shy and so inverted that they're going to be pets. So recognizing early and then expounding on those traits makes better dogs. Now the other half of that are the trainers. The negative reinforcement, it'll work, but then you have a dog that's working out of fear rather than joy. This is a happy dog because she's going to find those human remains and she's going to get a cookie. She is, her, her tail's up and wagging. Her head's up, the source is up top. There's a body in there. Look at me, I found it. Ooh, 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 ooh. This is a dog that works out of joy and they'll always want to do it. If you have a dog that works out of fear, you don't have a reliable dog. So we start out with a better dog because of better breeding in certain breeds. We learn what the dog is best suited for. You kind of want a more calm dog for a bomb dog, right? And then we train to get experience. The other half of that, besides getting a good dog, is being a good trainer. Dabby's my first dog. I've made a lot of mistakes on her. And she still finds it really well, finds the human remains. Um, but we've become better trainers, suiting the, the, the job to the dog, in other words. And practice, lots of practice. Learning to trust your dog is one of the hardest things. Because they'll know something's there and you won't see it. And you got to trust them. They know it's there. So I'm a veterinarian on a team. Why do I need to train a dog? Well, the handlers on my team said, Laura, you really ought to train a dog. It'll make you a better veterinarian. Better to understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, and what they need to, to succeed. Um, I remember at the World Trade Center, I was uh, fixing up uh, Moxie, a little, a little Labrador. And I was the third veterinarian this handler had been to because the others were, were not, um, were New York veterinarians. And they said, oh, this is too bad. We'll have to take her off. She can't search for a couple of days. So he just went to, finally got to me. I said, okay. I either glued it or sutured or stapled it put her bandage on and said, this will last you one shift, it'll come apart, come back and I'll put on another bandage. And she did, she did great. She said, thank you. You're the first veterinarian that's done this for me because there was not one handler that was going to sit this out. So they can work with a little cut. I mean, it wasn't a devastating injury. Um, it, it's, uh, it happened at Oso. Uh, the dogs were taken off by local vets, said, take a rest. I said, nope, give them some fluids, warm them up, they'll be fine, and out they go. So there is a learning curve. This is a learning curve for a little dabby do. She started out like from Georgia, like, whoa, what? No. <clears throat> and then she was in training, <clears throat> and then by 18 months she was certified. So she can go on the plane with me. <laughs> Um, she's a great demo dog, too, for first aid, and, and she's what I use with her mostly. <clears throat> but we do a lot of training in all venues, 
to expose her to as much as we can. They need exposure to noise from gunshots and diesel engines and helicopters to um, uh, environments. For live find, uh, they do rubble and wilderness. For human remains, she does um, bone decomp, fresh frozen. She does things that are high, things that are buried, things in vehicles, things that are burned. Um, and we do them all over the country. So the more training, the better. That's how you get a good dog. <clears throat> One of the things that happened in the FEMA system, um, you know, the, the dog, they, didn't, they weren't loved in the system by some teams. Um, most of the handles were civilians. They didn't follow orders. They, um, they did a so-so job. <clears throat> they wanted more compensation than others because they were training every weekend. They did okay. But in Haiti, they got to prove themselves. They found many victims live. And they, uh, because of the work that the handlers had done and the dogs, they were elevated into the eyes of FEMA. We got a lot more funding for the dogs. Coming back from Haiti, the dogs were given more money for post-deployment check medical checks than the humans. But I, I asked. They gave it to me. They didn't have to. <clears throat> so veterinary support is thought of now as a matter of course because the dogs did well. And they made FEMA and the United States look good. The same in Osa, Washington. Um, we deployed 23 human remains protection dogs from 19. They deployed me as the IST veterinary officer. First time. So seven years to get the position, another six or seven to be deployed. I was ecstatic. I'm not happy there was a disaster, but it was a great disaster. To, uh, it was a great disaster to show that the veterinarian could play an important role in keeping these dogs healthy, keeping them searching. I put on over 150 bandages to keep these guys going. They did really well. They found a lot of stuff. Um, and we were safe. And Washington was happy. <clears throat> and when Washington's happy, they give us money, if they have it. Replacing canines, um, I'd like to say never, but I never say never anymore. Certainly, if you have an extreme nuclear event, you don't want to send in dogs to look for human remains. They're going to die. But you could send in a mechanical robots. We certainly have infrared, special microphones, endoscopes for urban search and rescue. Uh, these all have a place. But when you need to find a living, breathing human that's buried in 20 to 50 feet of rubble, a, a good search came in is going to find them. So I don't see that we are going to replace them anytime soon. So um, the human-animal bond. I'm not going to get all weepy here. Um, this is really, really important. It's just below the surface of every deployment I've ever been on. Uh, I've been around for over 10,000 years. Those are my wolf friends up at Wolf Hollow that I also take care of. And, and all dogs, as far as we know, come from wolves. It's theorized they were domesticated over 10,000 years ago. There are shy wolves and friendly wolves. And the friendly one followed camps or uh, uh, prehistoric men. I don't know what happened, but here they are. And they are throughout our history. They guard for us. They search for us. They're companions for us. They're protection for us. From way, way back. And then we kind of stepped in and started doing some breeding so that we could emphasize certain traits for going after certain animals or protection or whatever. It's a long history. Why dogs? Uh, cats are great companions. Yeah, really. <laughs> they are. 
some people are cat people, and that's wonderful for them, because cats can do what dogs can do as far as make them happy. They're a little harder to take on deployment. Horses, some, some of the horses have the greatest personality, but you know they don't sleep at the bottom of your bed at night, right? Uh, whatever floats your boat, that's great. I, I don't care what it is. For me, it's dogs. And they have a very, very special place um, in, I think, not only in my life, but in many lives. I love this. I love this saying, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And that's all I have to say about that. It pretty much says it all. Okay, enough goofy stuff. Scientifically, you know that animals help humans in many ways. So this has actually been published. It's not just anecdotal. It lowers their blood pressure, lower heart rate, respiratory rate. They go to the doctor less. They feel better. They require less medication. Uh, my first dog was my inspiration. I quit smoking. Boom. September 1980. Never picked up another one because she sneezed and coughed when I lit up. She said, I'm done. And I was. So she was my inspiration <clears throat> 36 years ago. Um, they're used. We have um, pit bulls for parole. And uh, certainly the uh, military personnel suffering from post-traumatic stress, they have um, canine programs to help them. They're very successful. We use horses um, um, for children with difficulties. They ride horses. So animals are a, great, are a tremendous part of helping us throughout life. So when I have a moment, I see these things happening. There'll be, it's hard to explain the stress of a real deployment. There's enough stress in training and drills, but in a real deployment, um, uh, people change. And we're really there for a purpose. And I see, I, I see it. I see the people I've drilled with for years, they're just stressed. And a dog walks by. They just drop their hand just to touch the dog. Or they'll see the dog and just I see their shoulders do this. I see them smile. I see it in victims of disaster, pe the people that we go and, 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 and help. Um, and these dogs aren't searching. They're not saving lives, buried in rubble. Their mere presence helps team members and victims of disaster. It's incredible. And I have some photos here. This is in uh, Japan. The children are being evacuated without their parents. And this is um, Teresa McPherson. She's a canine handler with Virginia One, a very experienced um, handler. Um, helped me advocate for a lot of the things that we've gotten past in FEMA. And so this is just, just hanging out what they do. I see it all the time. I also see the people who don't like dogs. You can tell. They don't look you in the eye. They just walk by. Fine. That, 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 that's, it's going to be worse for them to touch a dog. That, that's fine. It's not for everybody. These are some... Uh, dogs get a lot of play in the press and on TV. Uh, you could save thousands of people from fires, but when a fireman saves a dog, that makes the front page, right? So this is just a little friendly meal time. Um, that was one of that's an actual deployment. Um, it's 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 just a stress reliever. Get around just a little bit. This was at Oso landslide. Um, they were showing what the dogs could do, doing a little demo. And this was in at the Connecticut uh, Vermont slides were in Connecticut first. And uh, this is one of this is Callie, the goddess of destruction. She's called. And uh, her handler, just people just come over and touch her. It's amazing. It happens all the time. It's great. Um, this was a, uh, a drill. We drill a lot with the military because when there's a disaster, 
military deploy. So we try to foster those relationships so that when, when we go out for a real disaster, the relationships are in place, we work well together because we train together, we drill together. They just, Dabby's very friendly, very approachable. I don't mind people ask. And uh, they're more than welcome to pet her. It also socializes her. Uh, she's uh, actually getting a massage. I didn't get a massage. She got a massage. Some of the, uh, most of the uh, members of our mass task force team are firefighters for their day job. And they save animals on their day job as well. They have no problems doing that. They don't get in trouble for it anymore. It used to be um, if an ambulance, uh, the ambulance uh, medics took care of animals, they were fired years ago. You can't do that or they were put on notice or got some kind of disciplinary action. Now, as long as the humans are taken care of, they can take care of dogs. A New York City mayor just signed a law that uh, the uh, police canines, New York police canines, are to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. They can go in the ambulance. I love that. I, I've only got to use blue lights once. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so even when these guys aren't searching, they're still helping people. Team members, victims. Right. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, do these search dogs also rescue other animals? So these are single purpose dogs. They are only trained to do one thing, uh, either find live humans or human remains. Some of the New York task force dogs are dual trained. They're also patrol dogs or drug dogs but we do not train them to find other animals. You can train a dog to find anything. Bed bugs, other dogs, cats, mushrooms in the woods. They have trained some dogs to find uh, scat of a certain species of animal in the woods to prove how many there are or if they exist. Uh, you can train them to do anything. I could train her to find other dogs, but FEMA prefers single purpose. But I believe, I'm, I'm almost sure I've read about someone who trained their dog to find lost dogs. To them, it's a game. And the purpose of the game is to win and get the cookie for her or the toy, the tug or the ball. They're not depressed when they find a human, a dead human. They, they, they're happy. I'm going to get my ball. I'm going to get my ball. They don't have that depression factor. At the World Trade Center, they weren't depressed because they couldn't find anybody. They, 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 they were depressed because, um, I'm sorry, they weren't depressed because there was all these dead bodies around. They were depressed because they couldn't find anybody alive. And they were frustrated. They were doing all the searching and not getting any reward. So myself and several others, we hid for these dogs so they could find us and get rewarded. It's a game to them. They don't have the psychological impact. Does that make sense? So absolutely, you can train a dog to do that. but. We're not training our dogs to do that. Yes? So including a vet tech, I would love to have a vet tech. I don't even have a place on the team. So in a type 1 deployment, there are 80 persons sent in a type 1. That's the big one. 70 are rostered, which means they're predetermined. Comms, logistics, plans, medics, search, tech search, canine, and those are all predetermined in 10. They used to be called truck drivers. Now they're using those 10 positions for veterinarians, extra tech specialists, because we're very digital these days. Maybe they take two extra dogs. Um, could they deploy a vet tech? Absolutely, but will they ever create a position? No. I believe the vet tech would have to have another job on the team, and then they could be a vet tech. That, um, you got to get me on first. 
So that is, um, I don't know, it, is, it takes a fair amount of money for them to train each person. So without an official position, it is less likely. But if you believe it's important, I would go for it. You can do something else. You can do logistics. You can do communications. You can do tech info. Uh, many of the people on our team do two or three different jobs depending on where they're needed. I did logistics for the first five or six years that I was there. I'm still technically a logistics officer. Ah, go do your thing. So, um, yeah, you try. Yes. Right. So the question is about training for human remains detection. Uh, Daddy has only ever been rewarded for finding human remains. If she finds a chicken and she barks at it, she doesn't get anything. If she finds, uh, 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 no. Only human remains. We use a lot of placenta. I have other more grisly things that have been given to me over the years or that I've acquired. <laughs> well, the placentas are easy if my friend's wife had a baby. I said, can I have that? She said, oh, okay. <laughs> Anytime anyone goes in for a surgery, I ask them to ask if they could give me their parts. Um, others are legally acquired. Um, they have a chain of uh, custody, and uh, someone has given me like a piece of liver or whatever from a human remains, and it's, you know, I have lots of gloves, and I have special boxes and, and jars and stuff. Um, I have uh, one person at a crematorium. There's a little dust left sometimes at the end, and he collected that and gave it to someone. It's, uh, there are definitely legal ways, and there are, um, we share. We share stuff. I have, a big, I have a freezer. It's separate. It's downstairs in the basement. Uh, one of the handlers with our team, he actually um, um, uh, retired, and he had a freezer full of stuff, so he gave us his freezer, and we have a, we log everything because it's a legal issue as well. Um, but if you have surgery and you have nothing to do with your stuff, I'll take it. <laughs> there used to be a bone store. Um, out of China that's been disbanded, but I, I got, I have something from the bone store. Uh, some people dedicate themselves to that, and so that's divided up by the owning body person. Um, so I never distracted her with anything but human remains. So if you were, so she might find something else, but she. She won't alert on it. Not now, not after six years. She, she hasn't had a false alert in, in a long time. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. So you said Yes. A team cannot deploy without four um, canines. On our team, that's me, yes. But uh, I'm only one of uh, four or five others across the country that are associated and trained to deploy with a FEMA team. The question was, of the 10, um, 10 truck driver positions where we can add extra, depending on the mission, is a vet always deployed? And that, no, because there's only, uh, only four or five of us that are deployable. Um, I was deployed as the... IST is the incident support team veterinary officer. So I'm deployed by Washington to care for multiple team dogs. That would be that. But if they don't deploy that, I just go with my team. And for example, at Hurricane Sandy, I just gave, um, we have a, a, a daily incident action plan. And so my name and number is on that for all the teams and they can always call me or go up and down the chain of command to request me to come to their team and care for their dogs. So I will take care of three, of, if, if I'm not officially deployed, I'm deployed with Massachusetts Task Force One and I can help anyone who needs help. It's, uh, it's 
such it's a long way from nothing. I'm I'm, I'm terribly pleased, just just delighted that I have an official position as do the others. We're covered legally, and um, and they use it. It's it's great. It's not perfect. It's not a vet on every team. To be honest, to have a vet on every team, there's only there's four, two and two medics, two doctors, and four paramedics to take care of 80 people. You're going to take one whole space to deploy a veterinarian to take care of four dogs. That's not that's not realistic. If there's there's um if we're taking up a space that could maybe be better used by another rescue person perhaps or another dog for a wide area. So in all fairness, I'm so thrilled with what I've got. I'm pretty happy with it right now. And it's also based on the generosity of my task force leader who loves having a veterinarian on the team. He's so supportive. I don't get paid to go to those meetings, but they pay for my flight and my hotel and my food. So it is a cost to them. But I hope I've helped by what I've done. So they look good. Yes. No, uh, all the canines were always they're always deployed with their handlers. Yes, online. So FEMA and different organizations to train these dogs was the question have different levels of requirements. I was taught um, the handlers on my team taught me and helped me train Davy. There are many organizations and individuals who train across the country. They give week-long seminars. If you belong to a local wilderness or regional team, they will help train you. And it's a business. People train dogs all the time. People train dogs for the military. A military dog trained is, I think, ten or $20,000, depending on the level of the dog. You can get a dog from, that's been screened maybe for 2,000, you can get them that have been trained up to what's called foundation level assessment for 5,000, or you can get a fully FEMA trained dog for 7,000. Or you can, and then you need to be taught how to be a handler too. I, I trained her from when she was three months old, and the handles helped me. In order to be certified, I have to pass a test, and I have to recertify every two years. FEMA's recertification is every three years. They have to do agility, they do obedience, and the search. The basic search is just two, two live people on a pile. The advanced search is um, three piles, four to six people, and you don't know where they are or how many they are, and they have to, they have to find them and not um, fail and not do a false alert. That's FEMA's standard. IPWATA, the International Police Working Dog Association, has a standard. USAR, the state USAR, has a standard. There's NAPWATA, which is the national association. There's a few. So depending on who you're going to join is the standard they will set. You must pass the test, and then you must recertify every one, two, or three years. You're welcome. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you very much.